Good morning and welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church of Wyoming. We are so glad that you are here and we are so glad that you are joining us online. Today is super, S-O-U-P-E-R, Bowl Sunday. Um, and we have been collecting items for um, Valley Interfaith to help with hunger. We've got all kinds of jars of peanut butter and spaghetti sauce and pasta and toilet paper. So if you brought anything, we're gathering that in the gathering space. And if you didn't, I encourage you to just go take a peek at what our congregation has done to do our little part to help alleviate hunger in our community. A few more announcements. Our task force, our COVID task force and our session have met um, and have determined that with cases coming down, we're kind of entering a new phase of things. So starting next Sunday, 
Um, we've made the decision to still encourage masks, but that next Sunday they will become optional, and that will be for both our 9.30 and our 11 o'clock service. We do encourage you still to kind of space yourselves out um, in the sanctuary, um, but if um, the mask is something that you're ready to um, say goodbye to, we will be going to some options about that starting next week. We have also a few major events coming in a couple weeks that we wanted to make sure you are aware of. On Saturday, the 26th at 7.30 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, um, we will be hosting, it's not our concert, but we are hosting a concert, Hear Us, Hear Them. It's a wonderful organization. Joe's going to be singing with them. Um, you do need to buy a ticket. That's through, there's a link in our um, e-news that we sent out through Eventbrite, or you can pay at the door. It's $10 a ticket, um, but it is sure to be a beautiful concert. We sent out a digital concert last year, and this year they're going to be able to sing in person um, so we can enjoy some live music. We also then on Sunday, the 27th, we'll have our annual congregational meeting. This will be the first one that we have been in person with you for. We've had some Zoom meetings, but this one will be together in person. We will be meeting in the great room um, at 10 o'clock a.m., so we hope that you'll come a little bit early on the 27th so you can come. The meeting itself will be at the end of worship. We will have a link for a Zoom meeting. If you cannot be in person and you want to be part of the congregational meeting, you can join by Zoom. We will be sending out information about that, the Zoom link and how to log in and all that information as we get a little bit closer um, so that we hope that all are able to participate. Well, let us gather our hearts and minds into a frame of worship as we listen to our prelude.
rise in body or in spirit as we join together in our call to worship. Come, God gathers us for worship like a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings. Our God, loving, nurturing. In love, God saves and supports us, teaching us the way we should go. Trusting in God, we continually offer our praise. Let us sing together, sing praise to God. intimately before a word is on our mouth God knows it completely there is nothing that we can hide from God and yet there is such blessing in us confessing to God knowing that God is eager to forgive and to restore us to right relationship let us confess our sins together and then in silence loving God no sooner have you knit us together than we unravel ourselves in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O oh God, as a mother forgives her child, 
wipe away our tears, bring us under the protection of your grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? No. As a a mother comforts her child, so will God comfort us. Children of God, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. by God, we can share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I would invite you to share a sign of peace with one another. Get it, Rob. Get the knees up. You can do it. (laughs) Good morning, everyone. All right. So, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Williams, I'm I'm praying that this is a good question to ask. We will see how it goes. I have a fun question. We asked at the 9:30 uh, with some kids, and we stumped them. They didn't actually have they didn't have an answer. It's a dangerous question. I yes, but Jesus was he was a dangerous man in some ways. So. We're on good, good turf here. All right, so here's the question. And you all can think about this too as it relates to your own life, okay? Can you think of something, Charlie, that your mom does either for you or with you that your dad usually does not do? Uh, she usually bakes me cookies and my dad not so much, but he does make a lot of good dinners. Okay, all right, there you go, good. Man, what a diplomatic answer. Good job, Charlie, good job. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this question. When I was a kid, we would go swimming a lot. And I remember my mom, she would get in the water and she'd swim with us a little bit. But my dad, oh my goodness. My dad would get in there and we would jump on his back and he'd be like a shark in there, like jumping up and down and trying to fly us off of his back. It was so much fun. But then my mom, one thing that she did that my dad, I don't think he ever did, is she would read to us before bedtime. She'd always, my dad would be down grading papers. He was a teacher. And my mom would come up into our room, my brother and I, and she would read to us. She'd read us a story, like a Harry Potter story or something, every night. I just just read to myself mostly. 
<laughs> Most of the time I read for like an hour, so it, it's easy to get through my book. Yay God for that, man. Reading is awesome. So that's something my mom would, would do with me. And if you think about it, Charlie, if you think about God as our father or as dad, that opens up all kinds of things that, you know, a dad can and should do for us. But if we think about God also as mother, that opens up this whole other realm of things that God can do for us, like a mother does for us. And so it just kind of opens up us appreciating all the many different things that God does for us. That makes sense? Yeah. All right, all right, there we go. All right. I'll say a word of prayer, and then if, if you want to go and have a little uh, uh, Bible lesson, we can do that. All right. God, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for caring for us, sometimes like a father cares, and sometimes like a mother cares. Help us appreciate all the ways that you care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wisdom, grant us your knowledge and discernment so that we may learn how to be, your, to be clever in our compassion and courageous in our faith. Through Jesus Christ and in the Spirit. Amen. Today we have two very short scripture readings. Uh, they're going to be both from Isaiah, one from 49 and the other from 66. And this is just a, a small taste, and we're going to talk about this in my sermon, but a small taste of the various images in the Bible that describe God uh, as a mother or a maternal or feminine qualities towards God. I'm going to read just a couple of these, and then we're going to talk about several others uh, in my sermon as well. So let us listen now for these two words of Scripture Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. The second reading is from chapter 66, verse 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can you go in? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I ask that you bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that they may be pleasing to you and help us to get a deeper understanding of who you are and what you seek from us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So it was certainly true for me for a very long time, and I suspect that for you the concept of God as mother is not a familiar one. Now for some of you it may feel strange even hearing that phrase, God as mother. Maybe you even feel that it's heretical to suggest this concept at all. And I would ask you, as we're going through this sermon, to keep an open mind as we explore this idea, because I think if we neglect the image of God as mother we are actually missing out on a very important part of what it means to be loved by God. Now, in my faith upbringing at Community Presbyterian Church in Hampton, Virginia, uh, the church I grew up in, 
I was taught very early on in my church life there that God was beyond gender. That was a very important thing that was communicated to me. In fact, I even messaged my pastor, uh, from who was the pastor of the church when I was there growing up. And he said, yeah, I always taught that God is beyond gender. And to assign God one or the other, a male or female, was far too limiting for the divine. This made complete sense in my mind. I got it immediately. Of course God is not male or female. God is above it all. God's everything. God's spirit. But, at the same time I was taught that, in worship and in my hymns that I sang and in the teachings of Sunday school, male pronouns were almost exclusively used to reference God. So you can imagine my confusion. On one hand, God is above gender, and yet on the other, we still call God He most of the time. Now why is that the default? Why is it that using feminine pronouns or images alongside the masculine been so controversial? Why has it been resisted by the church as a whole? Now, I could take a few guesses, and I'm sure you all would have your own guesses of why that is as well. Uh, you know, it may have to do with the authority structure of the church being male-dominated. You may, be, you may go all the way back uh, to when Christianity was founded, that they were trying to, div- to change how, you know, there's other, other religions that had female deities, so they didn't want to be like them. Um, And there's probably ten other reasons why. But how we got here is a whole other sermon. And I am not a trained sociologist, it turns out. (laughs) I found out this week. But what I do want to show today is that this concept of God as mother is not actually foreign to Scripture. In fact, you're going to see in a minute, it's throughout Scripture. And that using these female images actually deepens our understanding of God's love for us and for creation. Now, as people of faith always should, let's start in Scripture to kind of get a sense of this. And I want to be clear up front. Unlike what Ann preached about last week, Abba, Father, Nowhere in the Bible does God, is God directly called mother. I want to be clear about that. Yet, now saying that, I do challenge you to look up the name El Shaddai sometime in your free time. El Shaddai, it's used 48 times in the Hebrew scriptures to reference God, and When you look it up, I I challenge you to tell me that that isn't basically calling God mother. El Shaddai. Yet saying that God is, just because God isn't called mother directly and leave it at that is to ignore, I think, a great deal of scriptures that use feminine and motherly images to describe God. Now we start with Genesis chapter 1, right? The very beginning, I'm going to preach on this in a couple weeks, but just to kind of give you a little teaser here, where God creates both humanity, creates humanity in both male and female in God's image, telling us that God contains both within God's self both masculine and feminine qualities. The most commonly, uh, common motherly image of God we see in the Old Testament is that of a hen or an eagle covering her young under her wing, a symbol of what God does for Israel. Now, other passages make it even clearer. Deuteronomy 32, 18 says this, You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. 
You forgot the God who gave you birth. I am pretty sure my mom has said something very similar to me a couple times. You forgot the mother who brought you into this world. It's basically God saying this here in Deuteronomy. You also get readings from Isaiah comparing God to a woman in labor or a nursing woman who, that helps make us clear of how God loves the people of Israel. Now, drawing from this tradition, jumping to the New Testament, Jesus, in Matthew and Luke, laments over Jerusalem, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones, and stones those who were sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. It's a beautiful image of how God acts as a mother to all of us. And it's clear as you read the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, that the New Testament isn't actually afraid to use feminine or motherly metaphors in describing the work that God is doing through Christ. Think about the term born again. You may remember in John chapter 3, the Pharisee Nicodemus shows up to talk to Jesus, trying to figure out what he's all about. And Jesus tells him, you have to be born again. Tell me that is not a motherly image of God who is born. If, if we're being born again of God, God is we're being born of God. That's a motherly image. Nicodemus is very literal. Yeah, Nicodemus is very literal. Yes, exactly. Yes, he is. He he asks, what, what can I go up in the mother's womb again? Right, right. He sees that image very clearly, right? God acting as mother. Um, Julian of Norwich, a theologian in the Middle Ages, popularized this idea of the institution of communion also having maternal qualities to it. Jesus says at the table, this is my body broken for you. At this table, Jesus is feeding us from his body. And that body is broken so that we may have new life. If that doesn't sound very similar to what a woman experiences in pregnancy and in childbirth, I don't know what else you clear you could be. Your body is broken so that new life can be brought into this world. Is that not what a mother does for her children? We don't even have time to get into how Jesus' tomb actually is a womb for his resurrection, right? The imagery is there throughout Scripture, even if it's not as prevalent as the masculine language. It is a part of our faith tradition that the biblical writers were not afraid to use to describe God. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with all of these images that I just discussed here in the Bible? I'm not advocating that we should eliminate all male metaphors for God with exclusively feminine ones. In fact, I would advocate it to use them alongside. Nor am I telling you to use them personally if they don't work for you. Maybe God as Father works best for you. But perhaps we might allow ourselves to mix in these metaphors more regularly into our prayer life and into our worship life. In order to enlarge our understanding of God and God's love. Just like a father, God does love us like a mother. And cares for us as a mother cares for her children. 
Scripture tells us so. And this gives us permission, I think, to be more diverse, more expressive in the language we use in our faith lives that include both the experiences of a fatherly and motherly divine love. And I think if we ignore it, we actually miss out, we miss out on all the the many ways that this mothering God brings us new life. I love this quote from Job 36, 38, chapter 38. Uh, If you know anything about Job, chapter 38 is where God finally speaks to Job after they've spent the previous 37 chapters trying to figure out why Job is going through what Job is going through. And God answers in a very long, drawn-out metaphor. And this is one of the sections that I pulled out that I think you'll find interesting related here. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? See how even God mixes the metaphors to help us get a sense of how the divine mystery works. Here in Job, God refers to God's self as a mother and a father at the exact same time. It's incredible. So if God could do it, then it's okay for us to do it. (laughs) Right? This is not about gendering God, like I said at the beginning. But instead, it's about expanding our minds and our hearts for new ways to experience God in our midst. No one metaphor or image can encapsulate God fully, but the more options we have, the better. Because they all offer us glimpses into the nature of our Creator, Savior, and Sustainer. Even more, by imploring these metaphors and images, we're acknowledging that the experience of being a woman is not somehow less than or less essential to a man's experience. That somehow women are outside of God's grace because God's very nature contains all the experiences, both male and female. And it affirms that all of us, both men and women, were created in the image of God. That is an important one. Because I think by using only male pronouns or only male images to refer to God, it would be easy to make the jump to say, well, Women are less than because they do not share in the divine spirit quite like men do. Now, it may sound strange to you to say God and mother of us all, but I encourage you to sit with it. See how these images of God as mother that we just discussed may help you see God in a new an exciting and different way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us remain seated as we sing our next hymn, Like a Mother Who Has Borne Us. It is uh, on the insert in your bulletin. Do the bulletins have inserts? Okay, good.
affirming our faith using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God gives us new life. God gives us in abundance. And from that abundance, we return to God our thanksgiving with our morning tithes and offerings.
us pray. God of abundance, we bring our gifts and pray that they are pleasing to you. We ask that our church, like a mother to her children, can fulfill the basic needs of those you bring our way. Bless these gifts, that they may bring blessing to those they impact. Amen. Please be seated. As we share our prayers with the people today, I will name some specific things, but also leave some space for you to name within your hearts or out loud people or situations um, that you would like prayer for. Let us pray. Tender God, who gathers us into your arms, who brings us rest, who nurtures and sustains us, we give you thanks for your greatness. You are so much bigger than we can imagine. Your care for us is deep and broad. You know our neediness and you nurture us into strength. You give your own body to sustain us like a mother feeds her babies. You gather us in to protect us like a hen draws her chicks under her wing. You give us life, new life, abundant life. So we know we can bring anything that weighs on our hearts and minds. Today we pray for your healing power for Patsy, Lisa, Alice, and all those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, bring your gentle presence and your tender comfort to those who grieve. Loss of a loved one, loss of a livelihood, loss of life as they know it. We pray for your wisdom and your guidance for all who lead, that they would seek you in all that they do, that they would be drawn into knowledge of you and how you provide for people. May they provide for people in their care, like a mother who knows and provides for the needs of their children. Lord, we pray that war would cease and tensions would dissipate. Use your peaceful power to put an end to violence. Especially today, we pray for the people of Ukraine and for anyone whose home is not a safe place to be. Lord, we pray for all the broken systems around us where justice is not present, where mercy does not prevail. We pray that you would help us to repair the brokenness around us, that you would spur in us the fire of advocacy. Be with all who are caught up in broken systems.
We pray for the earth, that we would learn to live in harmony with creation. Today, we also give you thanks for opportunities for joy and celebration. We pray that you would be with those who are playing in the Super Bowl today, protect the health and well-being of the players and the coaches, and for all those who are gathering together to watch. God, as your children, we join our voices with children across the ages who have prayed as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing our final hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, verses 1, 2, and 4. from the rich tradition that we saw in scripture let us now try and see if we can live with this motherly image of God who cares for us who gathers us like a hen gathers her brood under her wings to care for her, for all of us all of God's children sit with that 
and see how God may be loving you in a way you never imagined before. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And go Bengals!